Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, we have the one, the only, James LeBrie, singer of Dream Theater. Fellow Canuck. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> how you doing, guys? Kind of early. Good. I think Good. he's at his morning, morning coffee here. We're ready to go. Yeah, I got the two espressos in me, so pretty much all the uh, all pistons are firing for sure. Yeah. All right. So here we go. A view from the top of the world upcoming album tomorrow. 15 studio mm -hmm. album released on Inside Out uh, October 22nd. That's tomorrow. Big, big Correct. new album. And I guess we could start off with the tour, the tour that mm -hmm. never happened and everybody was looking forward to. So maybe you could just give us an update on that, James. Yeah. So it, it was a, uh, it just came down to how comfortable we were with going out. And, you know, we were getting kind of uh, uh, mixed messages from promoters and uh, our, uh, our agencies and just everywhere we, we were looking, our management was looking into it uh, across the board with uh, people that were out there, tours that were going on, tours that had come down. And it just seemed to us, I mean, you guys, I'm sure you guys are aware of this, but when you put together a tour and uh, the amount of money that's put into a tour is it's astronomical, um, you know, and the kind of production that we go out with is is pretty big. It's pretty substantial. So, uh, you know, we were just getting a lot of uh, indication that the bands that had been going out uh, were out for a week or two and somebody within the band or the crew came down with COVID and then the whole camp had to be shut down up to 10 days. Well, that that's, you know that's financially uh, disabling to, for any tour of any magnitude that you can, you know, just pull down a whole camp of uh, let's say 30 something people and the amount of uh, money that's generated while you're out there, it's just, you're talking 10 days where you're just dead in the water. So it, it didn't make sense to us. One, we were still concerned with our mm -hmm. health going out. And one of us, even though we're all fully, uh, you know, inoculated, so to speak. Uh, we were still concerned with one of us coming down, getting sick and not being able to proceed. And then the, you know, the business side of things. I mean, let's, if I want to be completely honest with you, it wasn't a unanimous decision. There was three of the guys in the band that said, no, we're we don't want to tour and we're not going out. And there was two of the guys in the band that said, come on, let's do it. Let's go for it. We're all for it. And that's what it came down to is that you know, it was uh, a majority vote that said, no, we're not about to go out. Yeah. What are you going to do? But yeah, I know that John yeah. Petrucci just said, uh, you know, he was one on the, on the two. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, it comes down to sometimes uh, you're going to have to agree to disagree. And, and granted, you know, as he put it, you know, I saw it, I was, you know, fans you know forwarded it to my my sites and stuff like that you know as he said he was frustrated well you know truth be known we're all frustrated that we're not out there touring that's what we love to do we love to be to be out uh but you know some of us felt that we weren't willing to take that risk and and come down with this uh you know unfortunate virus uh it, it just it just didn't seem uh to me and and to the other two guys that were on the, the side of fence that I was on, that it didn't make sense to to risk it at this point. But, you know, everything's being rescheduled. It's been postponed and everything's coming back online in February. And uh, I think we're going to be closer to not only more people being vaccinated, but also herd immunity. Uh, immunity. So let's see what, what happens. You know, yeah. definitely. Yeah, no, a lot of bands were hoping that 2021 would be the year. But uh, yeah, I mean, concerts are getting pushed back every day now into 2022. So it's it's part of the norm and we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed for 2022. So, Sure, absolutely. Yep. So let's get mm -hmm. to the album, A View from the Top of the World. I mean, uh, right. <laughs> again, another Dream Theater classic. Uh, what, um, you know, 
I hear a lot of influences on this. Uh, do you still incorporate some of your earlier influences into the music or you're just you're, you're too much in the dream theater mode or sound to, to, to let other outside influences uh, affect the writing? Yeah, I don't think that we, you know, we're aware what's going on, uh, you know, as far as being contemporary and, and being in the now. Uh, we're, we're aware of what's going on musically out in the in the world around us. But I, I think that we've always um, just stood true to ourselves, first and foremost. So, you know, there's an identity there. There's a familiarity when people spin a, any given Dream Theater album. There's, you know, you can identify with it immediately. And uh, I, I think with us, you know, definitely like a, a lot of people have been saying that a lot of fans that have heard any snippet of, of the album uh, have said, wow, you know, it seems to be uh, reminiscent of some older material or more classic dream theater. And I think, you know, definitely we did reach back into our roots. Um, I guess you could say that. Um, and, you know, I've been saying all along since I started doing uh, interviews for this album uh, that I think subconsciously you can't help but be affected uh you know on our, our last world tour we were playing scenes from a memory we were honoring that anniversary of uh, 20 years and we were playing that album in its entirety from beginning to end and i think that you're you're somehow reminded of what happened throughout that album what made that album so dynamic and enamored our fans with it is the fact that the way that it did uh, play and 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 it was very cohesive and all the styles were incorporated and um, whether you were going from a song of strange deja vu or home or uh, you know finally free uh, there's just something that, that uh, it speaks volumes as far as who and what we are and what we represent musically and I think that kind of you know just uh, we, you you play it every night you get close to it you start to analyze it. We'd even have discussions about, you know, uh, some of the moments throughout that album and, and why it was so special, not only to us, but to the fans. And so I think when you sit down, I mean, we, we knew before going into the studio that we wanted to write an epic. That was absolutely, you know, everyone was on board for that. So I think when you know that you're going to do something like that, it opens up all the possibilities for the rest of the album to unfold as such. We didn't want any time constraints with distance over time. It was about, Hey, let's get in, let's bang out an idea. Let's, you know, conclude and then, you know, move on to the next. And it was, you know, those songs were very concise. They were anywhere like four or five minutes. And, and um, I think it really spoke uh, loudly to, to our fans because they weren't expecting that. Um, whereas this album was, let's get back to, not having any parameters that we need to be concerned with consciously and just let's, you know, write what we feel um, we're all being inspired by or we're influenced and we need to create to make a classic dream theater. Album. And I think it really does stand on its own this album because of that. Yeah. Um, what's it like being a Canadian, the only Canadian in the band and, you know, and writing this album or even touring an album, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, we're Canadians, you're Canadian. I mean, there must be right. an outsider feel when you're writing or playing with the band or trying to get together with the band to write this album. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, you know, if anything, I'd say that it's Are the Canadian jokes a, always going on or. <laughs> well, no, we, yeah, we do that once in a while. Yeah. We do that once in a while. Like, you know, whenever I say, well, it's about time they'll go about yes, it's about time, you know, and, and stuff like that. And Hey, yay. And, uh, <laughs> but I mean, that, that's seldom, but, but we do have fun with that, you know, and then I'll go right into the uh, Newfoundland kind of accent, which is like, what is that? A combination of Irish and uh, uh, God, I don't know, but you know, I'll go, Hey guys, by daddy geez there, we might want to be going down there, you know, but it, it's, it's, it's all in good, good nature. But the thing is, is that I think that it creates uh, an identity. I mean, you know, with Dream Theater too, uh, there's that that respect because, you know, one of their bigger influences was was Rush. You know, uh, growing up, and then being from that country, there's just that that immediate uh, recognition that there's a lot of great talent 
in Canada, and there is. There always has been and, and continues to be. Um, so I never felt like an outsider. I felt like, uh, if anything, it just gave me my own identity, you know, and, uh, and it was something that I could proudly, you know, carry the flag and say, yeah, you see, you know, here's an American band and, uh, they, they searched and searched and it wasn't until two years after searching that they found the vocals for their band. And that was a Canadian. So it just, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's a true testament of the, the kind of talent that, that stands in, uh, and has always been in Canada for sure. Well, m- mentioning Rush, I mean, I'm listening to Transcending Time, which is probably my favorite track uh, besides the title track on the album. And I mean, just that opening feel with the guitar and drums, I, it just it mm-hmm. feels so Rush, Rush-like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know what? It's funny because when when we were putting that that song together, and even when I was in there and, and singing the vocal for that, I was like, oh my God, if if, if our fans don't automatically, you know, uh, make that connection there's something completely wrong but yeah it is you know like it, and it and it's always throughout our career there's always always have been moments within our music where people go oh my god you can tell like that is rush you know and that's uh you know that is a definite yes. nod and respect to that band and, and those guys are incredible um you know i did a a few years ago i i i guessed on a rick emmett solo album and uh, and I, I had the pleasure. It was my second time meeting Alex Lifeson. And, and what a what a gentleman, you know, like just a true down to earth, amazing musician. I've always said that, you know, he was uh, one of the uh, the unsung heroes for some strange reason. Yeah. As far as a guitar player, I think he's one of the greatest guitar players out there. The stuff that he created on the guitar is unbelievable. It's just incredible. And um you know, I, I think um, just, you know, and hey, I shouldn't go without saying it'd be remiss of me not to mention that Rick Emmett, too. What an incredible talent. No what a gentleman, there. you know, and a beautiful voice and just so talented. And, um, you know, so being and sitting amongst those guys and and those guys, you know, knowing about Dream Theater, it, it was funny because rick emmett's son came into the studio that day to get a picture with me and rick says you know how, how's that james he says my son is more into you than than his father as a singer and i said hey trust me rick my kids both love other singers besides me <laughs> i said so it just it runs the gauntlet you know we, we're both part of that so but yeah i was uh but uh, you know i think that's what it comes down to is that there's there's a lot of incredible talent uh, when I first came into the band way back in 91, um, you know, the, the first thing I said to them is I said, you know, hey, one of the beautiful things is that I live just in Toronto. So for me back then to fly into New York, it took 50 minutes from gate to gate. Nowadays, it's an hour and a half, but we all know the reasons why. But, um, you know, and I said, I have no intentions of moving down here. So if you guys are good with that, let's be a band, you know, but I, I want to stay in Canada. I love the area friends and family and they were like yeah of course you know and uh it's worked out beautifully over the years you were introduced yeah. right was it from lee aaron's management or yeah so and al Danova was in the mix somewhere and well you see it, it kind of hails from so where all you canadian. guys are yeah 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 so it was all canadian so i was in a band called winter rose and we were out with lee aaron touring lee aaron came up to me and said hey do you have any uh stuff that you've recorded because i really love what you're what you're doing out on stage every night and how you sound and blah, 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 blah. I said, yeah, here's a disc. And I just thought she wanted to like, listen to it. And at the time we were being looked at by Atlantic records, uh, winter rose. So unbeknownst to me, I guess her real name is Karen. And she sent it to, uh, this guy at Aquarius records, which is up around you guys yeah, yeah. at the time. And, um, it was, his name was Pierre Paradis. Oh, I think yeah. I'm not. Um, and he, um, listened to it and he called me uh at the time and he just said hey just want to let you know that i'm so and so i was told about you and i've been given a, a disc of yours and i'd love for you uh, to offer you a, a solo album and i said a deal and i said well no i, I got my band <laughs> winter rose i'm sticking with these guys you know and he said okay well you know uh, let me get back and he got back to me hey how would you like to sit down and write with all Nova? you and him can write an album together I said, hey, listen, I really appreciate that. And I think Alda's great, no doubt about it. 
And I said, but that's not my plan. It's either winter rose or it's, it's nothing. And then, so what he does, he sends the tape down to New York to MCA records because he had connections down there. They mm-hmm. heard it. And then they threw it at dream theater, the guys in dream theater and said, you got to listen to this guy and the rest is history. Yeah. Bada boom. So, yeah. So get, mm-hmm. Just getting back to the album. I mean, uh, just quickly for everybody that hasn't had the chance to listen, you know, answering the call, it gets everything you ever wanted a dream theater song in that one. And uh, like mm-hmm. you said, a view from the top of the world, that's an epic that you made out to uh, that you, you know, was your goal to, to write. And I mean, how does this feel compared to all the other epics you've, you've written? Well, I, I guess you're, you're just kind of caught up in the moment. I mean, right now we're really excited with, with this current album. And then, you know, I, I think it just, each album has its place and its, uh, its closeness to you. And um, so I think for any band or any artist that's releasing an album, it, it's you're, you're currently, you know, engaged with, with the present. And with us right now, it's, uh, it's all about this album. It's all about the songs. It's, it's what we created. And you're, you're just really pumped and excited about people really being able to immerse themselves and, and really engage with, with, the, with the music at hand. I mean, when I sit down, sometimes I can sit down and I can, listen uh, to the a song from this album or that album once in a while. And I do it very, very rarely. It's just be, and, and the reason is, is that I think, um, you know, when we are touring, that's we're, we're just uh, inundated with dream theater music. So the last thing you're going to do is go home and listen to dream theater music, the, the stuff that you're a part of. And I think that stands true for any artist out there is that you want to listen to other artists or you're just you're just not you, you just get away from like i uh, the other part of this is that i have a, another solo album coming out in may may 20th 22 so what i do a lot when i'm when i'm writing that kind of stuff is i don't listen uh, i tend to make myself not listen to other music because i don't want in any way something to influence me that's coming on online from someone else. So I want to just be completely isolated and thinking within my thoughts and what I'm feeling at the time. And and that becomes the music. And um, so I think, you know, it's, it's uh, when I hear something like, uh, well, you just said it, it's, it's probably one of your favorite tracks is a view from the top of the world. Well, I'm listening to that, you know, and then I listen back to whether it be the count of Tuscany and I go, yeah, you know what? These two, they make sense. These two, you know, obviously a view from the top of the world is, is longer, is a longer epic. But the fact is, is that you can tell it's from the same band and you can tell that it, 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 it brings you on that same kind of a ride, that same kind of a journey. And I think that's, that's extremely, uh, well, that's the point to any of this is that no matter what we're doing at any given time, it has to be something that you can stand behind 100 percent and feel that you've you've done it with full conviction well a quick question i got a two-part yeah. cork my good friend cork is the biggest dream theater fan in this <laughs> neck of the woods he wants to know uh-huh. who your favorite singers are and the bands that you listen to regularly oh boy okay well favorite singers are robert plant ian gillen uh freddie mercury lou graham nat king cole uh rod stewart um steve perry uh oh my god um geez i don't know that that's what's on the top of my head right there uh yeah. and then and then with that like i mean you know robert robert plant just and freddie mercury and uh like i said even like steve perry like those guys what what stood out with me oh steven tyler is another one from errol smith like all these guys you could you could tell within the first line who you were listening to and they all created their own style. They, they definitely had their own voice. They had their own sound. And I think that's what I was influenced by. And it was the way that they used. It was, you know, whether they were being aggressive or evocative or, or whatever it might be, uh, that they, they had uh, nailed the, uh, what you expect to hear when you listen to any singer, and that is expression. And that even if you didn't understand the language, you can still feel what uh, the message was it's conveyed strongly 
And um, so that's why those those vocalists influenced me. I remember my dad saying to me when I was about 10 years old, because I was singing since I was five. And by the time I was 10, I was singing around the house all the time, all the time. And I remember my dad saying, you know, sounds great. Like whatever you're whatever you're singing, you know, you got this nice, pure, high voice. But create, he said, one thing to remember, create your own sound. And I remember thinking as I, you know, as I grew older and that, and I'm listening to my inspirations, I'm thinking, yeah, that makes sense because each and every one of these guys has their own sound and has created their own style. So it made perfect sense to me from an early age to pursue that goal. Um, as far as bands, pretty much any, any of those bands that those guys front are bands that I listen to regularly uh and you know another band that i love and another singer is bono from u2 you know he he stood the test of time and i think he has a beautiful voice he has a unique voice um but uh you know i, I also like young the giant i think that they're a very cool band i like one republic there's another guy ryan tedder he, just a great singer and great writer um so these are these are bands that that definitely uh, strike the chord with me yeah mm-hmm I got, I got one for you. Okay. Here's yeah. a question from Orlando. Like these are all my friends want to ask you questions. Mm-hmm. When Iron Maiden lost Bruce Dickinson, was there any talk or any ask, you know, or audition? Would you like to join mm-hmm. Maiden? Cause you would have been the perfect yeah, sure. fit at the time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. There was because at the time uh, we were being looked at to be managed by uh, Iron Maiden's management. And oh. so uh, Rod Smallwood uh, at the time, um, we were out playing darts and he took me aside and he said, you know, what do you think about, which was kind of, you got to remember, I was in a very bizarre situation. Dream Theater, we had already recorded images and words. We were looking for management. We were getting ready to try and set up a, a, a tour and get out there. And, and I remember him saying to me, you know, he takes me aside and the rest of the guys in, in Dream Theater, they're there too playing darts and that because we were looking at at him for management and he says i just want to throw something at you and he had this assistant with him too merc at the time and um they're both standing there and they're going uh, what do you think about you know uh being the singer with with uh, iron maiden and i said what <laughs> Dude, what what are we talking about here I'm, I'm confused are you not here for the reason that you might start managing dream theater or are you here to get me to become and i'd already recorded yeah. Can you imagine how bizarre that was? Anyways, so I just said, no, no way. You know what? I'm going to tell you the reasons why I'm not going to do this. And they said, what's that? And I said, one, dream theater. That's it, period. And I said, but if I need to go any further with this, way back when I was 22 years old, I sang for a band called Coney Hatch for a year. You know, yeah. And I walked into another singer being Carl Dixon. Uh, right. Is it Dickens or... Carl Dixon, Dixon, right? Dixon, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I said, and basically what I felt like was a glorified jukebox. And I said, because I came into a band, I was able to sing all that stuff. No problem. No problem. And, and I said, but there was never that this is me. And this is what I created. It was about, can you accept me? And are you looking at me for who and what I am? I don't think so. And I don't think you ever will. So walking into Bruce Dickinson's uh, and Bruce and I have this mutual respect for one another. We've met several times. We've done several shows. I remember doing the BBC show with him, you know, and, and there's that, that mutual respect between the two of us. And, and, and I remember just thinking, I'm not going to get out there and be singing Maiden every night, even though I think they're a great band and Bruce is a great singer. No, thank you. It's I need to create something that I can say, no, this is what I created from the beginning. You know, and we all know, okay, I wasn't on the first album, right? Uh, when Dream of Day Unite. But for still, neither but was still. Neil neither was Neil Pierre. On the first <laughs> neither was Bruce Dickinson. So and neither was Bruce. There we go. See? See, you guys are talking my language. <laughs> exactly. So you know what I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, it it was just a bizarre and it and it came and went as fast as it was asked it was dismissed and they went all respect totally get it no problem boom and we moved on all right yeah. closing two minutes yeah. here uh we love okay. the album at least i do i think it's yeah. you know it's it's you know what it is they're short 
quick, uh, they feel like short, quick, melodic songs, yeah. but they're not. Yeah, then you look and it's 10 right. minutes long. What? Like, they are so <laughs> yeah. enjoyable. I really dig this album. I love the solid production. You do a great job. I love the vocal hooks, the melodies. You know, they're oh, contagious you. and it's a real yeah. grower. It really is. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. I, I think we really do, guys. You know, I say it every time, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it again and, and fully behind this 100%. It's a, it's a real gem. And I think the, the fans, once they can get their hands on each and every song, uh, you know, they're, they're really going to appreciate what we put out here. And I can't wait to get out touring, you know, James, there's, when, when, there's no when, doubt about it. When you, when you have your solo album and you want to release it, come back on. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk Absolutely, more about guys. Canadians. Yeah. Absolutely. Tomorrow is wait. the big day. Everybody will get to listen yeah. to it. It'll be released tomorrow. Yep. Excellent guys. No, absolutely. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll definitely talk about the solo album. Absolutely. We'll do Thanks right. guys. Stay Thanks, well. Bye.